LGT Vestra, please, um, David Scott. We know a lot about fintech here in this room, but you are at the other end of the market. You are giving through the Liechtenstein family access to the most exciting investment opportunities. And banking is not just fintech, it's also access, and that's what you get through LGT. Please come on stage, and we are very glad to have you our partners. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I feel uh, slightly daunted by the number of um, high-tech, fintech uh, people, and I'm afraid uh, we're from a slightly more Luddite uh, industry. But I think, nonetheless, there are still a number of points that I think we all sort of share um, as entrepreneurs. And I think what I want to really try and demonstrate today is that while this wealth management itself might be quite a dull experience, a lot of you are probably going to need it at some point, and it's more important to understand, I think, some of the, the aspects that you need to look for. And I think, as entrepreneurs, we get called many things in our lives. Um, these are certainly some of them. Um, I think I've probably been called all six of them, and probably a lot of other names that I couldn't possibly print either. Um, and I think we probably should have put a, a very, very thick skin around that brain as well. Um, but that's one of the things we live with. Um, definitely rule breakers. I think all of you are all rule breakers here. And by definition, we're all obsessive and compulsive people. Otherwise, we wouldn't do uh, what we wanted to do. So I think in setting up business, there's probably two tips um, that I could give you. There's many hundreds of tips that you can get from many books about Harvard MBAs and stuff like that. But the first one might be, try and start your business with a really good PR launch. This is obviously a good thing in order to get your business going, um, and it's one that we should have taken to heart. Uh, we didn't. Um, we launched in 2008 um, when 72 people joined us from a, a certain bank, and we ended up with a lot of negative publicity. So arguably not the best way to get going, but it was something that we sort of had to live with. Then secondly, um, if you're trying to launch your product, try and find an optimal time to do that. Obviously, you can't control everything, but if you can try and sort of plan it for optimum market conditions, that would be good. Again, we got that horribly wrong. Uh, two or three weeks later, Lehman's and the global financial crisis uh, decided to sort of um, cause havoc, I think we could say. So we were in the precarious position uh, in August, September 2008, when we had 100 staff, we had offices opposite the Bank of England, uh, costing us probably a couple of million pounds a year. Our revenues were zero. Um, no existing clients could deal with us, and certainly no new client in their right mind uh, would deal with anybody post these sort of headlines. So it was certainly a challenging moment. Uh, it's the reason I probably lost two stone and I'm probably as gray-haired as I am now. Uh, but if you have to live through that sort of um, experience, I think you can sort of come out of it very, very strong. Why did we actually launch the business? Well, I think in that sort of period running up to that, I felt that the clients um, were being treated really as fodder or as food for these big, big global um, entities that all they were really doing was obsessed about short-term revenue. You could see the products they were being launched. It was all about money today and not really worrying about the long term. And that obviously led to this complete uh, breakdown of trust in the financial services. What we tried to do a fundamental point is that we recognize that it's the client's money that we're looking after. Uh, and our, the name of the company at the time was Vestra Wealth. Vestra is Latin for yours, so it was your wealth. And that was our fundamental belief that it's your money that we're looking after. So we should really listen to what you want to do and see whether there's a way that we can help uh, to try and do that. We took a decision that th there would be no kickbacks and retrocessions. The industry was very much based on that. You, they charged the fee to the clients, but meantime, they were sort of getting paid uh, from the various product providers, effectively behind the backs of clients, and, and clients did not realize this was going on. I thought that's a fundamental way that you should not run a business, so decided not to take that. Again, it was a bold move. It meant cutting off a big revenue stream uh, at that time, but it was the right thing in, in the long term, and I'm glad to say the regulator in the UK in 2012 subsequently outlawed that practice. Um, so we were probably four or five years ahead of the time and probably paid the price, but I think ultimately, uh, it was absolutely the right thing to do. Again, if we're trying to manage people's money and we're trying to be independent right across um, the whole sector, we took a decision not to have our own products to sell because if you're turning to somebody for independent advice, the last thing you want to do is to feel that they actually have their own product that they're then trying to sell you. 
And again, investment decisions, you get a lot of companies where they base their decision based on benchmarks. And you know, for example, Japan might be 5% of the world index, and you get a lot of companies sort of saying, well, we think Japan's rubbish. We think it's a hopeless place to be. I'm not saying that is the case now, but uh, as an example, um, we do not believe in it. So therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to underweight our portfolios. So instead of putting in 5%, we're going to put in 4%. I don't understand to the life of me, and I know I'm an Irishman, so I can't help that, why you would put 4% of your client's money into something that you think is rubbish. I just don't get that. Well, it's a big risk, you know. Risk compared to what? Risk compared to a benchmark. Well, most entrepreneurs that I've met don't really care about benchmarks. They've never even heard of benchmarks. It's stuff that our industry has come up with to try and make them look very, very clever. Most clients are just concerned about putting their money with somebody who believes in what they're doing and will invest in the areas that they believe to be the right thing. Finally, after three years uh, trying to do this job properly, we actually got this headline in the Evening Standard, which for many of you is sort of our main sort of uh, evening paper. And I have to say, it was probably one of the most powerful bits of um, press that we could get and certainly made a difference from, from three years prior to that. So I think that's an example. If you keep doing the right thing, ultimately it will come good. As we've sort of continued and developed, um, We'd had a lot of external funding because we didn't have enough money of our own. Um, and then we knew a point was going to come at what stage do we then seek a partner that would take us for the long term. And I think this is important for all of you when you look at how you raise money and where you raise money from. The most important thing I would say is that your shareholders, where you can control it to the extent, are absolutely aligned with what uh, you as the management are trying to do. And I think certainly in our industry, this is where you get a lot of... Um, mismatch between what the investors want and what the business is trying to do. And in our business, you're trying to create a long-term uh, business. So it was very important that you had people who understood that long-term and were prepared to take that, that long uh, approach. So the, the Liechtenstein family, um, through the LGT group, uh, took a majority stake in our business in 20, 000, sorry, 2016. And since then, it was very, very important, you know, looking at Prince Max in the eyes and sort of saying, right, do I feel that this person is going to be the right partner for our business in terms of our long-term growth? And again, I think it's gone well. At that time, we had six billion under management. And as of now, we look after 14 billion uh, for private clients. A lot of them are entrepreneurs. A lot of them are sort of city people. And it's certainly one measure of encouragement. But how did we do this? We tried to measure ourselves against two goals all the time. I don't know that we'll ever achieve it, but this is certainly what we aim to do, is that success will be when 100% of our clients love being a client, recognizing it's quite hard to love being a client of a wealth management firm because it's a pretty dull experience for most people. Um, but we try to make sure that they do enjoy it. And again, you know, we probably suffer from a lack of uh, digital thing, which is why I feel sort of slightly out of place here. But at the end of the day, we're in a very, very personal, feely touchy uh, industry and we want people to know and understand that we actually listen to what they want to do. And then finally, if you have 100% of your staff loving work in there, then they're obviously going to deal uh, with people very well. Fundamentally, I think this is the key thing in our business. Again, it's all about building long-term relationships. Um, and a long-term relationship or partnership has to have two ingredients. It's got to have respect from both parties. And again, I think that was what happened pre the financial crisis. One side of the, of the uh, party, i.e. the investment management industry, lost respect for the private clients. Hence, a lot of the fallout that sort of happened. So you need that, and it's got to be mutually beneficial. Again, it was all one-way traffic uh, pre that financial crisis, and I think, unfortunately, it's still around. But if you recognize that it is that, and the day that you engage in a relationship with us, you hopefully believe that it's going to be uh, beneficial to you, that it's going to be value for money. And the day that you don't think that is the day you should actually terminate uh, the relationship because we've lost the right to look after your money at that point. I think finally, all I would say is, despite whatever happens and all the travails you go through and listening to some of the people today, I think most of us have had difficulties along the way. Uh, we get sort of knocked off course. As someone once said, you know, a business plan doesn't survive first encounter with the enemy. And that's certainly true. I'm not saying the enemy is necessarily some of the people we refer to here, but it's something. It's how you adapt to that. I've seen so many business plans. We invest in a lot of private companies, and every business plan has a lot of similar characteristics. Uh, the graph on revenue seems to go from the left 
and it seems to go in this exponential growth on the right. I don't know why that is, whether it's a standard slide that PowerPoint presents, but it's not always like that. I, I don't think I've ever seen sort of straight line revenue growth like that for sort of a continued period. But I think you've got to have that determination. And again, what I want to look and see when I'm talking to entrepreneurs is do they have the guts and the resilience to actually overcome a problem if it hits there? And I think you know, listening to people's sort of creativity and how they deal with issues is something that I think is very, very important. And I think taking all of these things uh, together, I think it's something as an entrepreneur, we understand how you think, how you behave. Again, a lot of people in our industry don't. They rock up to entrepreneurs who have maybe sold their business and they've got a liquidity event and they completely forget that that entrepreneur is a complete control freak that is probably obsessed about every single little point of their business and then suddenly they've got this liquidity event and they've got some cash and someone rocks up to them and said, give me all your money to manage because we're good. And they just don't want to, you know, nobody's ever really going to do that when you've obsessed for 10 or 20 years about everything about your business. So it's a real understanding issue that I think, unfortunately, our industry gets wrong. I think we understand it properly, and I think that's why we're here today um, as sort of co-sponsors of, of the NOAA conference, because people like yourselves, even though I'm dressed in a ridiculous tie, and I was going to take my tie off, and I thought, no, sod it, I'm just going to wear it anyway. Um, I think we understand entrepreneurs, and I think having gone through that journey, having tried to raise money, we had Goldman Sachs that back us at the start, we then bought them out, we had other investors. I remember one weekend being told I had two million pounds uh, that I needed by Monday, and having to ring a few people and said, you know, can you please give us some money? And um, one guy telling his wife, we're going to invest a million pounds and we're going to lose it in the next 24 hours or else we'll do go okay out of it. So I've always been grateful for people who trusted with us. And I, I think all I would like to do today is to wish all of you much success in what it is that you're trying to do and um, delighted to be a part again. So thank you very much. Thank you.